Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Over and over again throughout the scriptures, the prophets pick up on this theme of, of journey, of running towards, of walking towards, of making a path straight. Torches, torches, run to Bethlehem. Run with the news that the Messiah he is coming. And in those words we often hear from the prophets, the valley shall be filled in and the hills will be made low on the highway back to God. Now for the prophets, these journeys were, were made on what our tour guide in Belize, uh, when we were on a cruise a number of years ago, uh, we had a, an excursion to the uh, Mayan temples in Belize. And uh, as we were on the bus for, I think, about four hours before we actually got to the temple and then four hours back, the tour guide was, uh, as we went through Belize City, was saying, you know, it's a busy city, we're at the rush hour and other things. And, and he was making a comment about sort of the disparity between the rich and the poor huge disparity. And um, he was saying that most of the citizens of Belize uh, had BMWs. And we thought about it for a minute, and we're always saying, then he explained, well, it's better me walk. And we chuckled, but it was also a very poignant story, a very poignant story about wealth and the disparity between the two. But when you think of journeys, we often use the phrase, the, like, we don't walk a lot, but we talk about things like when the rubber meets the road. Maybe that's a little bit of a better metaphor for us today. But for the prophets of old, it was where one's feet meet the road. That was important. But have you ever really looked at feet? Have you? How many times have you overheard a parent, a grandparent, a great aunt or uncle who's staying with you or you're staying with them and exclaim to their partner at bedtime, oh, keep those gnarly, dirty feet and toes away from me. Anyone heard that? I still hear it. <laughs> <laughs> feet stink. And they look weird. The only exception might be when you're first born. Oh, aren't those lovely? The prophet's feet in particular are probably gnarly. Toenails deformed by fungus, the contour of the skin reshaped time and time again by calluses that form over miles and miles of tough terrain. No wonder it's important to make straight the path to our Lord. Isaiah says, How beautiful are the feet of them who bring glad tidings of peace. How beautiful are those who run with the torches to proclaim the good news of Bethlehem. I mean, feet, think of it, they anchor us to the earth. And so many cultures have you take off your shoes so that you can connect with the earth. And we get quite earthy. They get dirty, they get muddy. And even places around the globe where sanitation is an issue, they can also get 
a little messier. Or if you happen to be on a horse or a dairy farm. Jesus' feet were beautiful feet. Not just when he was a baby. I mean, surely Mary kissed them over and over again as she tended and cleaned her sweet baby. Sweet feet, sweet little feet. But she'd have known the reality of the dirt and the splinters that were coming once he started his journey. His journey in a carpenter's home in Joseph's shop. His feet would grow and change and be changed by the pounding of the earth as he traveled dusty roads, proclaiming that the kingdom of God is so very close. I mean, Jesus cared about feet. Just think about the number of stories that we can encounter that connect us in that very wonderful way. It's in a very incarnational piece. Walking on water, hiking from village to village, the disciples listening at his feet, having his feet washed with tears. And of course, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, knowing that his own feet would soon take, make their last journey in the dirt of Golgotha. And they soon would be ripped to shredded by nails of the cross. I mean, the resurrection doesn't clean that up. There are still those scars that remain, and they're very poignant, to remind us of his connection with us and with the earth and with the pain that we can encounter. You probably have heard the saying, how are your feet and ears? So as we prepare for Jesus coming once again, for our journey of discipleship, perhaps we should think about how are our feet and our ears. At a gathering a few weeks ago, the Reverend Ivan Gregan lamented to that we don't often talk about Joseph in our story. Lots of things about Mary and the shepherds and everyone else, but Joseph sort of set aside. Today's text is that rare occasion that we hear about Joseph. It reminds us of the preparations for that first Christmas where anything but conventional and we're far from proper. Joseph, whom the text tells us is a righteous man, discovers that his fiance is pregnant. And he decides to do the right thing, to divorce her, to let her go under the law and under custom. Now he decides to do it in a way that doesn't shame her, but still he decides that this is the right thing to do. And that's what our story is about, is about taking that sense of righteousness and doing the right thing that custom and culture demand and finding those moments of compassion, those moments of care. Now, we know, and the narrator tells us, that the child is of the Holy Spirit. But such things are unheard of at this point to the characters in the story. To Joseph, the pregnancy is a violation of social convention and ethics for any couple. He decides to divorce Mary and more humane and to be more humane in his custom, in the practices of divorce. And perhaps out of kindness or regret, he will do this quietly in order not to shame her. 
and he realizes that things are not going to go as planned or as convention would have them, Mary was simply violated the important moral rule that she should not be pregnant when they were not married. We are all like Joseph at times, aren't we? We go about our business and we do not want to make trouble. We just want to handle things quietly and without a fuss. And in light of this story, it is helpful to think about the ways that the faithful thing to do and the faithful way to be are sometimes at odds with social convention. Joseph remained faithful to Mary because God, as God often does, intervened in an unexpected way. God sent an angel to appear to Joseph in a dream, and the angel basically said, I know that this is not what you expected, but it's going to be okay. God is about to do something wonderful despite the fact that according to Jewish custom and law, you are in a rather socially unacceptable situation. But remember that God is with you and God will always be with you and through you, God will save all humankind. So for us, amid all our less than perfect Christmases, per, uh, less than picture perfect Christmases, the Christmas trees that are not quite as perfect as we'd want them to be, the lives that are not as perfect as we would want them to be, God is with us, and God does something new. Lisa Debney she's from the Iona community in Scotland, shares a particular metaphor about Joseph. And it's one that I think can speak volumes for us today. She writes, My arm around your back was all that I could offer as support as each unraveling chapter came. My arm around your back was there when you first heard the news that heaven dwelt in you, and words fled faster from me than response. My arm around your back was all that I could offer you to reassure you that I would never desert. My arm around your back was all that I could offer as support on Bethlehem's weary road. As the journey wound round path and streets and doors closed swiftly, in our faces. My arm around your back was all that I had to protect you from despair. As the child emerged in an open barn, my arm around your back was all that I had to help you through. To be a leaning post, it seemed, was all that I could do to show that I struggled with you in the birth. It doesn't seem enough for ones who's destined to endure so much I should have words and eloquence or money, land and powers of protection that would buffer you against the harshness of this world. But all that I can offer is my arm around your back. Its strength will never be enough to show the strength of love that holds me to your side, but ready still to comfort, to steady and to reassure my arm around your back if needed will be there. So as we move from this place towards Christmas, with God as our guide and our companion, may we remember to place our arms around each other's backs, knowing that each of us travels on precious and beautiful feet. And may we remember that the soles of our feet Touch God's precious earth. And may the back street, the forgotten place, be lit up with significance far beyond our wildest dreams this year. And may all the households of earth prepare to welcome the child of heaven, the one who comes among us 
the one, the one who is one of us. And may our songs rise to surround your awesome mystery, your awesome glory, as together with our arms behind each other's backs, our knees bend to approach his cradle. Amen.